Thanks, everybody. Um, so my paper is called Colorless Substances, Contentless Forms, Hardy and the Ends of the Novel. And I'm feeling a bit like a contentless form right now. Um, I'm recovering from an illness, so um, I'm going to chug water and probably cough a little bit, but um, hopefully I will make it through. And um, there are a lot of ideas in, in this paper. It's a bit of um, kind of raw material at this point. It's pretty new, so I'm looking forward to your feedback. In chapter 10 of The Origin of Species, entitled On the Geological Succession of Organic Beings, Charles Darwin draws an analogy between the cyclical temporality of fossil formation and the iterative quality of species modification. The process of natural selection, Darwin argues, is not sudden nor even, but rather like the process of fossilization that indexes it, slow and gradual. Speciation happens, he writes, when, quote, slight differences accumulated during many successive generations are selected. That is, when variations provide advantages to survival in a particular environment. <coughs> New traits, however, emerge neither abruptly nor uniformly, but rather materialize over long and irregular intervals of time. Quote, I believe in no fixed law of development, Darwin writes, causing all the inhabitants of a country to change abruptly or simultaneously or to an equal degree. The process of descent with modification can be observed within the Earth's crust in fossils that preserve evidence of species past. But the fossil record, Darwin is quick to point out, is neither a perfect nor a direct transcript of speciation. This is because the layers of sedimentary rock that comprise the geological record too materialize according to a slow and iterative temporality. Periods of subsidence in which sediment accumulates in, shadow pool, in shallow pools, allowing fossils to solidify, are interspersed by periods of land rise in which organic remains are crushed or washed away. Such cycles of accumulation and dissipation, subsidence and uplift ensure that the Earth's crust is uneven and gap-filled. Darwin introduces the fossil analogy in chapter 10 of The Origin of Species in order to highlight the protracted and iterative temporality of speciation, as well as to stress its contingent nature the contingent nature of the process through which, as he puts it, variations or individual differences are accumulated through natural selection. And he kind of repeatedly uses this language of accumulation. The modification of species, he argues, consists not in the gradual unfolding of biological matter toward a natural telos, but rather, as he puts it, depends on many complex contingencies, on the variability of a on the variability being of a beneficial nature, on the power of intercrossing, on the rate of breeding, on the slowly changing physical conditions of the country, and more especially on the nature of the other inhabitants with which the varying species comes into competition. We might extend Darwin's fossil analogy here to suggest that those who understand the transformation of a species as the gradual revelation of a pre-given form confuse the process of fossilization with that of excavation. Where the subtractive process of excavation reveals a form preserved from the past, species formation proceeds additively. Again, like fossilization, which occurs through the accretion of sediment and subsiding areas, natural selection, in Darwin's terms, is an accumulative action. So I'm kind of interested here in the way that this analogy um, is kind of producing fossilization as a thing with the same temporality of the thing that it's indexing. Um, and so the question is kind of whether that indexicality of the fossil record is kind of made possible by these, by these shared temporalities. The geological record, Darwin stresses, indexes the life and death of forms imperfectly. It does so because its infinitely stratified layers of rock tell a story that is not only gap-filled, given the vast amount of time between rock formations, but non-linear, with periods of subsidence neither 
Within periods of subsidence, neither sequence or, nor continuity is preserved, and a fossil from one century may lie in the same layer as a fossil from a century much later. As Darwin puts it, as the accumulation of enduring formations rich in fossils depends on great masses of sediment being deposited on subsiding areas, our formations have been almost necessary accumulated at wide and irregularly intermittent intervals of time. Each formation on this view does not mark a new and complete act of creation, but only an occasional scene taken almost at hazard in a slowly changing drama. Such a slowly changing drama, enacted both in life and rock, is the subject of Thomas Hardy's final novel, The Well Beloved, A Sketch of Temperament. So I'm going to be kind of talking about this novel, which I'm pretty confident no one will have read, because um, it's a weird Hardy novel. Um, but I'm going to kind of be outside of the novel a lot of the time, um, so it shouldn't kind of require too much knowledge of the plot. I'll kind of describe that first. Um, so the well-beloved chronicles across successive generations the romantic and artistic exploits of a neoclassical sculptor named Jocelyn Pearson, who chases after the ideal form of a woman he calls his well-beloved. Attempting to capture in both life and in art this, the woman who embodies most fully the well-beloved, Jocelyn pursues this ethereal figure as it migrates from woman to woman, subordinating the material particularity of his individual lovers to this ideal form. After materializing in various women of different appearances, some have blonde hair, others are brunette, some have light skin, others have dark skin, the well-beloved then kind of gets magnetized to the particular biological makeup of a particular woman, and then passed down as if inherited from Avis Caro, as she's called the first, to her daughter, to then also her daughter, who's also named Avis Caro. Um, so there's three generations of Avis Caros, and there's a sort of like incestuous insularity to this man's obsession with this kind of form, which is sort of biologically produced. Um, so the well-beloved is this kind of way of um, giving form to the shape of the kind of particularity of this person's desire, and it also kind of functions as his sort of excuse for his promotion. Askewity, right? He's always faithful to the same um, ideal. It's just that that ideal is traveling around. Um, so my initial premise is that Jocelyn is a kind of bad evolutionary theorist, the one that Darwin is arguing against in The Origin of Species, who approaches individuals as kind of materializations or instantiations of the ideal form that is the species. Like the drama of speciation told in on the geological succession of organic beings, in which the sedimentation of rock serves as a model for how organisms consist not in the slow unfolding of an ideal or pre-existing form, but instead emerge through spontaneous accumulations of variations. In the well-beloved, form is not something that is transcendently imposed or revealed, but rather something that materializes contingently throughout time. Such materialization occurs on the level of the narrative of the well-beloved, in that while the women that attract Jocelyn's interest always initially seem to embody the same ideal form, he is always disappointed to discover that the well-beloved always materializes with a difference. Each time a particular woman fails to fully embody the sculptor's transcendent ideal, its plot restarts and Jocelyn must be begin anew his quest. These plot repetitions, however, never return Jocelyn to an earlier moment, but work to underscore the temporal and material, dif material difference of each narrative events, um, of each narrative event from narrative events past. It's like incredibly repetitious novel. It's not particularly fun to read because the plot kind of repeats itself as soon as um, the well beloved vanishes and, and reappears again. <clears throat> The iterative quality of the well-beloved is not merely contained to its narrative, however, which, as I've been suggesting, is structured by a plot so linear that it collapses into cycles of oscillating progression and regression. Its publication history is likewise iterative, marked by two distinct versions. <clears throat> 
Well, Hardy first published the novel in serial form in 1892 under the title The Pursuit of the Well Beloved. In 1897, he extensively revised and republished the novel in single volume form under a new title, The Well Beloved, A Sketch of Temperament. Thus, although Hardy's novel is almost always understood to be Jude the Obscure, his 1897 revision of The Well Beloved was actually his final engagement with the genre. The novel's indeterminate position in Hardy's corpus has meant that most critics have felt authorized to overlook this uncharacteristically fantastical work when addressing the most dramatic shift in Hardy's literary career, his abandonment of the novel form at the turn of the 20th century and his turn almost um, wholeheartedly to poetry. The fulcrum between these two very distinct periods in Hardy's career, however, the Well Beloved is a crucial site for considering Hardy's relationship to novelistic form. The book looks forward to Hardy's, return, to Hardy's turn to poetry, as well as backward to his 30 years of experience with the novel genre. <clears throat> Hardy once explained his abandonment of the novel after Jude with a suggestion that the genre was, quote, gradually losing artistic form with a beginning, middle, and end. Rather than resisting such narrative disintegration, the well-beloved seems to embrace it. It is both a novel and an anti-novel, lacking a clear beginning, middle, and end. In its reiteration of tropes and lines from previous Hardy novels, moreover, the well-beloved seems to look back upon Hardy's career as a novelist, distilling his novelistic corpus into its most basic structure. The well-beloved features a plot yet more schematic than that of Hardy's other novels. Its setting is yet even more isolated and enclosed. Marcel Proust once remarked upon this reductive quality of the well-beloved in A Remembrance of Things Past, citing what he calls Hardy's characteristic stonemason's geometry as evidence that while the theme of an author's work may change, certain figures reoccur constantly throughout their oeuvre. And this is your first quote. Do you remember the stonemasons in Jude the Obscure? Proust's character Marcel asks Albertine. And in the well-beloved, the blocks of stone, which the father hews out of the island coming in boats to be piled up in his son's workshop, where they are turned into statues. In a pair of blue eyes, the parallelism of the tombs, and also the parallel line of the boat and the nearby railway coaches containing the lovers and the corpse. The parallel between the well-beloved, where the man loves three women, a pair of blue eyes where the woman loves three men, and in short, all those novels which can be superimposed on one another, like the houses piled vertically on the rocky soil of the island. The protagonist of The Well Beloved treats women in a way not unlike the way Marcel approaches Hardy's novels, as variations on the same theme. Evacuated of their particularities by Jocelyn's idealizing gaze, the women Jocelyn desires are reduced to integers in a mathematical sequence. Avis 1, Avis 2, Avis 3. In this, the novel might be said to perform what Luce Irigaray called, quote, the indefinite series of one plus one plus one of the male economy of desire. As objects of desire, the avises spur on the plot like a motor whose revolutions produced protagonistic forward motion. Jocelyn's development, on the other hand, sets the metronomic pace of the narrative, the measured forward-moving temporality of his Bildung highlighted in the novel's three parts, a young man of 20, a young man of 40, and a young man of 60. In this, it could be argued, in its very structure, the well-beloved works to parody both the Victorian marriage plot, exemplified in Jocelyn's romantic quest for the perfect woman, as well as that of the building's roman, exemplified in jo Jocelyn's quest to form himself in and through his pursuance of this ideal build of a woman. The problem I want to suggest today um, of the well beloved, um, and there are a lot of there are a lot of things that it's doing, um, but I, I kind of want to name that problem as the problem of generation, generation in a double sense. First generation as a kind of motor for life, that is the question of how difference itself is produced in order to perpetuate life. So the kind of Darwinian question of how do variations erupt. 
and second as a as generation in terms of temporal sequence that is how sameness is perpetuated across generations marked by temporal difference thus binding together entities produced in that succession the science invented in order to explain this temporal negotiation of sameness and difference, I'm going to suggest today, was the science of heredity. Its central question was, what is the nature of the structure through which both differences are accumulated and sameness perpetuated? In the 19th century, terms like germ cell, germ plasm, and gemmule gave shape to the vehicle thought responsible for this dual activity of perpetuation and differentiation. Was the basic unit of heredity a type of cell, a protoplasmic substance, or a subcellular physio physiological unit thrown off from cells and transmitted through the tissues of the body? So it comes with some of the questions that were being asked in this particular moment. Was it a material upon which information was indexed or imprinted? Or was it rather a container, a shape? Mendel had published his now famous essay, Studies on Plant Hybridization, already in 1865. However, the essay would not achieve wide circulation until the early 1900s. Until the turn of the 20th century, then the nature and function of the basic unit of heredity, as well as whether or not this unit could be transformed through its interaction with the soma, so that is whether, like, whether acquired traits are inherited, um, was, was the other kind of big driving question. All of these things remained unclear um, until, until the turn of the 20th century. In what follows, I read Hardy's novel as an attempt to come to grip with the temporality of sameness and difference, stasis and change, that the structure of heredity was invented to explain. And so I'm kind of thinking here about the way that Nathan was talking about structure yesterday in Plato's Timaeus as a kind of negotiation of sameness and difference, being and becoming, form and matter. Um, but in this paper, I guess I'm kind of interested in putting pressure on that platonic structure itself, um, or I think that Hardy's putting pressure on that. Um, and asking how it is that that particular conception of structure, um, that is structures that produce form as stasis and matter as becoming, um, came to organize the world in a way. Um, and I'm kind of thinking about using the word the world that way and in a way that Frank Wilderson uses it. Um, and I can say maybe a bit more about that in the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to be talking about kind of racialized structures of, of worlding. The Well Beloved helps us to think about the ways that 19th century conceptions of, fundam of the fundamental unit of heredity were instrumental to producing a modern racial paradigm in which form became the precondition for the persistence of sameness and what I'm kind of generally going to call surface as the site for the perception of difference. Ultimately, I will suggest, building on the work of Irene Tucker and various historians of science, that the modern racial paradigm turns upon such a logic, a logic in which coloredness, and in in specifically blackness, is a surface phenomenon whose negation is a whiteness that is clothed as a durational but also transposable form. So um, there are just two sections. The first section is called germ cells, germplasm, gemmules. <clears throat> the problem of heredity struck Hardy as an interesting concept for a literary work in 1889. He wrote in his diary in, in February that year, <clears throat> quote, the story of a face which goes through three generations or more would make a fine novel or a poem about the passage of time. In the following years, Hardy would write both the novel and the poem. The poem, which you have on your handout, Heredity, describes an immaterial form that lives on after the death of the physical organism. I am the family face. Flesh perishes. I live on, projecting trait and trace through time and times and on, and leaping from place to place over oblivion. The years aired feature that can in curve and voice and eye despise the human span of durance. That is I, 
the eternal thing in man that heeds no call to die. One answer to the poem's riddle, I would suggest, is the germ cell, germplasm, or gemules, all terms variously used to describe the substance or unit responsible for transferring hereditary material from one generation to the next. When Hardy describes the eternal thing in man that heeds no call to die, he echoes various 19th century hereditary scientists who characterize the fundamental unit of heredity as a durational form or substance, a vehicle or medium that ensured the persistence of qualities throughout time. 19th century theorists of heredity often invoked metaphors of immortality and eternality in order to explain how such sameness was preserved. This is a quote, organic bodies are perishable, wrote the German physiologist Johannes Müller. While life maintains the appearance of immortality in constant succession of similar individuals, the individuals pass away. Müller's student, the embryologist August Weismann, likely desc likewise described what he called germplasm, chymplasma, as, quote, the undying part of the organism, stressing the capacity of this neutral substance to live on after the death of the individual. In contrast to what he called somaplasm, which was transformable and perishable and died with the organism um, that it was a part of, germplasm was unchangeable and durable. <clears throat> and I'm going to return to this bifurcation later between the germ and the soma. <clears throat> Hardy read Weismann's essays on heredity in late 1890, but he would also have encountered such ideas through English biologists like Darwin, whose theory of pangenesis had accounted for acquired traits in its theory of gemules. According to Darwin, all the cells of the body throw off gemules, which self-divide and disperse throughout the blood. Passed on through, re through reproduction, when enough like gemules swarm together, they develop into cells and allow for the emergence of certain qualities, while other of these gemules lie in wait and are not developed into cells in that particular generation, but could develop into them later, which kind of explains latency. <clears throat> so whatever this mechanism was, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about everyone's particular theory of, of how heredity works. Um, the, kind of fundamental question was, what is it exactly that endures? What was the structure responsible for the arbitration of sameness and difference across time? In Hardy's novel, I'm arguing, the durational unit is the well-beloved, which is initially characterized, as in the poem Heredity, as a kind of transcendent form. As the shape that gives form to Jocelyn's desire, it is a kind of remnant or trace of lack emerging when a woman's particularity is obscured or her materiality diminished. Following the sudden death of Jocelyn's first love, Avis Caro, Jocelyn experiences a sudden increase in his desire. Quote, the flesh was absent altogether. It was love rarefied and refined to its highest attar. He had felt nothing like it before. The correlation between what, what in the well-beloved is described as the absence of corporeal matter and the presence of the well-beloved thus defines the well-beloved as a kind of form without content, a container for the transmission of whatever matter. After the well-beloved's brief manifestations in Laura, the flaxen-haired edition, Marcia, a woman with Juno's classical face and dark eyes, as well as various other women um, of varying physical appearances, as I've said, the well-beloved takes up permanent abode in the biological makeup of the Caro family. After the death of Avis I, the well-beloved is passed on to her daughter, Avis Caro, and then subsequently to her granddaughter, Avis Caro III. The narrator explains this, what is kind of a subtle mutation in the novel. I'm like really drawing attention to this mutation. Um, but there's sort of only one line that kind of explains what's happening in this shift. Um, and the narrator says, it was as if the Caros had found the clay, but not the potter where other families whose daughters might attract him had found the potter but not the clay. 
So while within the first half of the novel, the matter, so to speak, of the woman desired is of no consequence, in the second half of the novel, it becomes the case that only the Caro family, as the narrator puts it, possessed the materials for her making. <clears throat> now, the name Caro has its etymology in the Latin, meaning flesh or pulp specifically in relation to the inner part of a fruit or the white interior of a tree. Its Greek equivalent is kreos, meaning meat, flesh, or body. And its Germanic root is kern, kernel, core, marrow. <clears throat> The shift in the nature of the well-beloved from form to substance, I want to suggest, aligns with a kind of historical shift in the biological sciences from a molecular to a plasmic conception of the fundamental basis of life. <clears throat> well, during the first half of the 19th century, one finds that the central building block of life is often perceived to be the cell. As the century progressed, biologists increasingly called into question the structural emphasis of cell theorists. Key here were the objections to the cell theory put forth by Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann by the, by the German and Swiss botanists Hugo von Moll and Karl Nageli. Nageli and von Moll, Gerald Giesen explains, <coughs> quote, attacked the emphasis placed by Schleiden and Swann on the cell wall by suggesting that it was really the cellular contents which sustained the physiological activities of the cell and which were particularly important in the formation of new cells and in the formation of the wall itself. By the late 1860s, the debate as to whether the fundamental unit of life was more the formal structure or the, of the cell or the contents of that structure, what von Moll had interestingly called protoplasm. People had used that word before, but his is the first usage of that word in a scientific sense. Um, this debate had largely shifted toward the latter. Protoplasm is, is everywhere by 1860, and a kind of key moment um, in, this, in this shift is a lecture from 1869 by the British biologist Thomas Henry Huxley entitled On the Physical Basis of Life. In that lecture, um, he argues that all living forms are united by their basis in protoplasm. Protoplasm, he writes, quote, simple or nucleated, is the formal basis of all life. It is, as he writes, the clay of the potter, which bake it and paint it as he will, remains clay, separated by artifice and not by nature from the commonest brick or sun-dried clod. In Huxley's description of protoplasm, we discover a figure similar to the one invoked by Hardy, by Hardy's narrator, to describe the substance of the Carroll family. Where Huxley invokes the clay metaphor to insist on the ubiquity and universality of this fundamental substance of life, however, Hardy, somewhat differently, refers to clay as if it were a specific material that characterizes the Caro bloodline. So I'm interested here how um, when we start thinking about the fundamental basis of life, the condition of, for life's persistence throughout time, it, it's getting figured as a kind of colorless substance through protoplasm. And the way in which we might kind of think about the, I mean, it's, it's often a contentless form or a colorless substance. Either way, there's a, there's a kind of minimal qualityness to this, to this structure that is repeatedly stressed. So um, there's Huxley in the, in the next, um, in the next se selection of text that is on your handout there. And I won't read it out, but he's um, talking about these colorless corpuscules that, um, that one can observe th in the blood. <clears throat> so it is the way that Hardy is marking, or as I would argue, is racializing this material through his description of the Carl women that allows for the possibility of elucidating a kind of racial politics in the well-beloved. As I will argue in my second and final section, Jocelyn's desire for a pure and ideal um, woman in the well-beloved can be read as a commentary on the discourses of race and racial purity that emerged in and through the science of heredity and the metaphysics that those structures participate in. So my second section is called Oolite, Ooloids, Eggstone. Eggstone. 
In focusing on the discourse of otherness at work in Hardy's description of, quote, the strange beliefs and singular customs of the inhabitants of the Isle of Slingers, Hardy's critics have overlooked the possibility that the Isle described in the Well Beloved, it's a sort of enclosed island where all of this takes place, might represent less an otherworldly or othered place of fantasy than England itself. One of the most striking qualities of the Isle of Slingers is that it is an island of monolithic whiteness. Upon returning to his native isle from London, right, so there is England and then there's this isle, but I'm kind of arguing that the isle is England. Um, upon returning from the native isle from London at this novel's start, the novel's protagonist, um, Pearson, is struck by, quote, the unity of the whole island as a solid and single block of limestone, four miles long. All now stood dazzlingly unique and white against the tinted sea. The unity as well as uniformity of the limestone isle is reflected in the genetic makeup of the isle natives who, isolated from the mainland, are the product of centuries of inbreeding. The white homogeneity of the island rock thus mirrors the white homogeneity of the Karo stock. Throughout the novel, references to the whiteness of the objects of Jocelyn's desire abound, including, but not limited to, Avistu's white teeth, white neck, skin as white as sheets, as well as, quote, the exceeding fairness of another lover, Nicola, her neck and shoulders, which, though unwhitened artificially, and this is a quote, were without spe speck or blemish of the least degree. Elsewhere, the novel references women's use of pearl powder, a cosmetic used to whiten skin. But the racialized implications of Jocelyn's desire become most explicit, I'm arguing, when the well-beloved makes her home in the pale-skinned and light-haired phenotype of Avis Caro, becoming fundamentally associated with this woman's idealized whiteness. In the 1897 version, um, this, these racial implications are highlighted even more strongly in the revisions. Um, there's a line that's inserted in which Jocelyn says, I know the perfect and pure quarry she was drug from, she was dug from. Um, again, kind of analogizing um, her materiality to that of, of the limestone isle. <clears throat> So while much scholarship um, on Hardy has explored the representation of gender, sexuality, and class, almost no attention has been paid to his representation of race. I really couldn't find hardly anything, um, which is striking to me. Um, but you know, I think this is because Hardy's novels feature very few characters of color, but I don't believe that that should prevent us from, from analyzing racial discourse um, in his works. So um, attending how the ways that the ways, attending to the ways that Jocelyn's desire for the well-beloved is racialized um, allows us to see how Hardy investigates the kind of unmarked quality of whiteness in and through attempts to grasp the mechanism of heredity. In racializing Jocelyn's desire for the form of the well-beloved, I want to argue, Hardy's novel questions a newly emergent scientific paradigm in which race is produced through the conceptual isolation of bodies from environments. And with it, isolated is the fundamental structure of heredity, the gemual, the germ plasm, or um, the germ cell from the soma. As historians of science Stefan Muller-Villa and Hans-Jörg Reinberger have demonstrated, the science of heredity emerged not, as one might expect, out of a fascination with the similarities between parents and their offspring, but rather from a concern, and indeed often a desire to suppress and control variations produced through changes in environment. And this is the next um, quote on your handout. Muller, Villa, and Reinberger write, the knowledge of heredity started to unfold where people, objects, and the, relationship among, and the relationships among them were set into motion. Mobilizing plants and animals, for instance, was a precondition for being able to distinguish between inherited and environmentally induced traits in organisms. 
only when organisms were actually removed from their natural and traditional agricultural habitats could environmental differences manifest themselves in trait differences and only then could heritable traits manifest their steadiness against a background of environmental change. Muller, Villa, and Reinberger contend that the desire to maintain regularity and consistency in the face of variation drove early attempts to understand the mechanism through which traits were passed on from generation to generation. As they write, only when these environmental ties were dissolved in favor of a variety of relationships between forms, places, and modes of transmission did a need arise for a complex metaphor like heredity to be applied in order to account for the proliferating phenomena of change and stability. The mobilizing forces of globalization, colonialism, and immigration, among others, were central to the emergence of skin color, in particular as a marker of racial difference. As Irene Tucker demonstrates in her stunning book, The Moment of Racial Sight, a dermatological conception of racial difference arose in part due to the supplanting, she argues, of a humoral model of medicine in which racial difference arose, um, oh sorry, so she's, her argument is that a dermatological conception of racial difference arose in part due to the supplanting of the humoral model of medicine in which bodily traits were understood to be the product or a reaction to one's environment with an anatomical model in which traits were stabilized within the body as part as the, of the standardization of medical practice. In the humoral model, Tucker writes, um, a conception of the body as highly sensitive and affectable um, in reaction to outside forces often accompanied theories of skin color as the literal product of environment. So um, she writes, the mixture of blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile determining not only one's immediate condition of health, but also one's more general temperament could be affected either deliberately or unwittingly by the proportions of heat, cold, wetness, or dryness in the environment. These same environmental forces work to produce the bodily characteristics by which geographically proximate peoples might be grouped together. Africans, for example, were understood to have dark skins and excitable dispositions that manifested in the hot, sunny, and wet environment in which they lived. So this kind of environmental conception of race that accompanies the humoral model, which shifts um, through the standardization of medical practice and the anatomical model. So where Muller, Villa, and Reinberger describe the emergence of a, sci of a science of heredity, thanks to, as they put it, obset the obsession of the scientific mind with regularity at the expense of contingency and complexity, Tucker reveals how the shift from the environmentalist conception of human difference to a biologized racialized science occurred not because of a fascination of difference, but rather here with sameness. And so she, her argument is, is very complex, and this book is, is really hard, but I'm kind of obsessed with um, working through it in, the, in this argument. Um, so within the anatomical model that standardizes the insides of bodies in order to pr produce what she calls likeness, or an idea of all bodies as like one another in a structural way, um, skin in this model becomes extremely significant for its capacity to body forth the effects or the, the sort of results of what's going on inside the body. So skin becomes incredibly important as a kind of signifier, as something that's legible and that is the site of the difference that papers over the sameness. As she writes, Quote, we begin to notice and care deeply about the color of other people's skin at the moment in which we understand our bodies to be fundamentally like other people's bodies. As an immediately visible sign, skin becomes useful for organizing perceptions of likeness and difference integral to the standardization of medicine. A concern with fundamental likeness and a desire to produce a standardized conception of life itself likewise characterizes the science of heredity in the second half of the 19th century. In his lecture on protoplasm, Huxley begins with the question of what unifies all life forms. 
quote, what truly can seem to be more obviously different from one another in faculty, in form, and in substance than various kinds of living beings, he asks. What community of faculty can there be between the brightly colored lichen, which so nearly resembles a mere mineral incrustation of the bare rock on which it grows, and the painter, to whom it is instinct with beauty, or the botanist, whom it feeds with knowledge? There is just cause, Huxley goes on to argue, to believe that, quote, some one kind of matter which is common to all living beings and that their endless diversities are bound together by a physical as well as an ideal unity. So I'm interested in the, in the way that this um, unity, whether it's figured um, as a form or a material, whether, which one, whether one of these is emphasized, um, is bearing forth that sameness or that, that likeness. And it, the way that it's kind of being figured as a colorless matter or, or contentless form. You can recall Huxley's colorless corpuscules. In this model, color is, as it had been um, often in the history of philosophy, a kind of psychic addition, what Locke, what Locke would call a secondary quality, produced as an effect of a deeper and under, an enduring colorless structure. Tucker describes how in the modern racial paradigm, and this paradigm, lest we forget, um, is not opposed to, but rather contiguous with the theory, kind of dominant in critical theory today, in which skin color operates as an arbitrary sign. So she's not opposing this thing, these things. She's actually drawing a continuity between them. Um, skin color takes on a superficial nature, the covering that covers over a fundamental sameness. As Tucker puts it, quote, skin went from being the porous boundary connecting bodies and environments to a boundary that concealed the defining likeness of one body with every other. In the modern racial paradigm um, that fueled and structured the formulation of a science of heredity, that is, the porosity of the surface is dissolved in the production of skin as an arbitrary sign of difference. We can see a similar move to repress the porosity of surfaces in order to produce self-contained forms in the theorization of the fundamental unit of heredity throughout the 1860s and the 1870s. In particular, in the work of Weismann, as well as one of the most influential theorists of heredity of the period, Darwin's cousin, the racial scientist Francis Galton. How is it, and this is Weissman, how is it that a single, that such a single cell can reproduce tout ensemble of the parent with all the faithful, with all the faithfulness of a portrait? <clears throat> his answer, importantly distinct from that of his predecessor Ernst Haeckel, as well as Darwin's theory of pangenesis, was that germplasm contained within it in microcosm the entire configuration of the organism and transported that configuration unaltered via the mechanism of reproduction. What was clear from Weismann's theory, as well as that of his English counterpart, Galton, and they're really almost theorizing it in the exact same way, but they don't have knowledge of each other, and then they find out about each other and are quite excited. Um, what's clear from both Weismann and, Gal and Galton's um, theory of heredity was that any modifications that the individual organism underwent during the course of that individual's life could not be passed on to the next generation. There's no acquired traits. <clears throat> due, and this is due to the enclosed nature of the germ system. It's unaffected by the soma. For both Weissman and Galt, for both Weissman and Galton, acquired characteristics could not be transmitted through the mechanism of inheritance because the soma system was entirely separate. So I want to read um, this attempt to isolate the germ cell from the soma as an attempt to produce what Hardy, in a diary entry from 1896, called outline without surface. That is, to conceive of a form unaffected by its surroundings. <clears throat> And I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to talk about um, the, that diary entry that's there on your handout. Um, but I'm going to kind of say that throughout Hardy's novels, um, 
<clears throat> the surface appears as a site where the accretive temporality of history materializes. It emerges not as a signifier that can be read or interpreted, not as a manifestation of qualities produced by a structure underlying it, but as a kind of coagulation or layering of the past that gets caked on from the outside. The well-beloved's concern with the accretive temporality of the surface is again apparent in the very substance of which the aisle is composed. When I mentioned that the aisle was composed of limestone before, I failed to mention that it was comprised of a sp specific type of limestone, and that's oolitic limestone, a white rock comprised by round egg-like ooloids, and that's the image um, toward the end of the handout. Hardy's aisle, I've suggested already, is all form and no color. As Jocelyn returns to the aisle from London at the novel's start, he's struck by, quote, the unity of the whole island as a solid and single block of limestone four miles long. So it's this singular and monolithic um, structure. But then in the next line, all now stood dazzlingly unique and white against the tinted sea, and the sun flashed on the infinitely stratified walls of oolite. So while the aisle at first appears to be a single unified structure, upon closer inspection, that structure is comprised of strata, which themselves are comprised of layers of bone and rock. Oolite are formed through the gradual accumulation of calcite around individual pieces of sediment, such as the skeletal fragments of marine organisms. The mechanism through which exactly oolite forms is even today still unclear. The researchers speculate that the bacterial film on the surface of the ooloids contributes to the accretion of the inorganic chemical precipitate. They are then cemented together to form larger rocks such as that which comprises the Isle of Slingers. Hardy's descriptions, and I'm wrapping up here, um, of the process of calcite accretion mining and sculpting that the limestone rock itself undergoes and that the island inhabitants perform on it indicate the protracted material history of the island and its people. The rock itself is historically central to the livelihood of the isle inhabitants with Pearson and the Caro families having long worked in the quarrying business and the houses are all built of this solid stone. But more than this, the rock, I'm arguing, embodies a kind of racial and colonial history of the isle, as Hardy's descriptions of its material composition makes clear. As the historian Antoinette Burton has gone great lengths to demonstrate, the notion still prevalent in my field, Victorian studies, that England ever was a racially or culturally homogenous nation is itself a fantasy, a fantasy of outside and inside, home and away, that she argues, quote, was itself a technology of imperial rule. A description of the process through which the physiology and characterology of Victorian England as a world is produced stands at the heart of Hardy's project in The Well Beloved, a novel in which the geological record of the island rock indexes in its fossil fragments the racial and colonial history of England. The stratified layers of Hardy's Isle, however, are not merely a ledger to be unearthed by archaeologists or interpreted by historians. These material accretions are not the remnants or remainders of a history past, but are the materialization of history itself. Thanks. <laughs>